let's talk about my equipment. Well, my brewing equipment. Welcome back to Method of the Meanness, I'm Burley Mullins, and if you saw that intro, you know that we're talking about my brewing equipment. Now, I decided to uh, split this episode up into, uh, you know, mini-series, uh, and start with my fermenters. It would be a terribly long video if I did this all at once. Um, let me know in the comments if you like this format, or if you want that super long episode. But, uh, you know, we're starting with the fermenters, and uh, before we go into them, just um, gonna go ahead and let you know that I'm talking about all of the fermenters that I've used through my mead making, uh, and I'm gonna start with a couple that I have gotten rid of or stopped using, um, and I'll talk about why. When I first got into mead making, uh, I was in college, and I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do this as a hobby, I just really wanted to taste mead. So I went online, found a couple of recipes, and I found um, somebody recommending using water jugs and balloon airlocks with a little pinhole in the balloon. Uh, and for me in college, not looking to sink a ton of money into a hobby, and, uh, you know, trying to do things on the cheap, that seemed like an incredible way to get started. And I used that technique for a long time. Um, I built onto it, I got vinyl tubing to just do siphoning straight from the tube, and that worked for me for a very long time. I made some pretty decent meat with that equipment. It was exactly what I needed in my financial situation at the time. And you know, if you're going to, you know, save on any part, I would say that the fermentation equipment, as long as it's food safe, is something that you can save on in mead making. Uh, and there's a couple things that you do actually want to spend the good money on uh, if you're trying to minimize, max, you know, min-max your investment in the hobby. I'll probably talk more about this later. Uh, I'll probably do an entire episode about that. <laughs> Let me know again in the comments if that's something that you want to see. Um, but then I moved on to a couple of uh, three-quart uh, jugs that cider came in, and then I bought a couple of airlocks. Uh, those were great um, for a long time, but there were a couple of problems with them. Um, I was still shaking them up to uh, get the honey mixed in and aerate the must. And, uh, and you know, the lids were the uh, jar kind. They weren't like threaded, they were like a jam jar that you can get like a Smucker's jar. Uh, they lost their seals eventually. Um, and three quarts was just an awkward size for me to use uh, mathematically. I, Previously, I had been using gallons. It was weird for me to scale back like that. And then I came into um, the next fermenter. This is a Mr. Beer. Now, these can be found um, in thrift stores all the time. I cannot tell you how many times I go into a thrift store and I see one of these. This is actually the second one I owned. The first one was a gift. And I do not know why I got rid of that. For, it was for space. I, I got rid of it for space. Um, I had mentioned before that uh, my housing situation wasn't conducive to doing lots of brews or really big brews. You know, I made some decisions and got rid of my Mr. Beer. Uh, this I got, the price is still written on the lid. It was six bucks and I think I got it on a half off day at a thrift store um, for the section this was in. The only problem with these is uh, they're only good for primary fermentation. Uh, just like the balloon airlocks with the, uh, you know, with the water jug um, fermentation methods, uh, this relies on positive pressure uh, to keep things out. Uh, there's a couple of channels inside uh, the lid that lets air out, so it's not airtight, which is good because you do not want a plastic bomb in your house. 
Um, but if you're making sparkling mead, this is a great way to start. Um, you know, it's two gallons, a little bit more. Um, the volume's marked on the back. Uh, and honestly, if you don't want to spend a ton of money to get started making sparkling meads, and uh, this is not a bad way to go for that. Um, or if you want to make ciders, or if you use extract to make beer, honestly, you can find one of these at a, th at a thrift store, and I do recommend you give it a go. This is a pretty standard three gallon carboy. Uh, many of you who already brew uh, will recognize this style of fermenter. Um, it's super duper common, and uh, I got the three gallon size because I also got a two and a half gallon or 10 liter, so roughly two and a half gallon, a barrel that I aged meat in. Um, and I also wanted to scale up some of my recipes just to see how well that works. Spoilers, meat scales pretty well. You need to buy two of these at a time if you're going to be brewing, uh, just so you can rack off the sediment into secondary fermentation and maybe even do another rack to clear it further if that's what you want. Um, but you need to have two and you need to keep one or have one empty when you need it. But otherwise, uh, this is a great workhorse. Uh, you cannot go wrong getting a uh, carboy, carboy style fermenter. Uh, there's, it's a standard for a reason and there are so many accessories that you can get that specifically go with these. Um, it's an easy recommend, especially if you're just getting into the hobby. They come in so many different sizes, one gallon, five gallons, six and a half gallons, and up. It's, <clears throat> once you get into the much bigger sizes, you'll need other accessories because it gets kind of a pain to be shaking it to mix the honey in and to aerate it. Most of you will recognize these. Um, these are the workhorses for this channel. Um, you know, one gallon fermenters with 0.4 gallons of headroom for really excessive <laughs> fermentations. Uh, they can get, you know, they can get pretty, uh, what's the word, energetic. Let's go with energetic. Um, I like the options of these. Uh, the wide mouth makes it really easy to put in and take out uh, adjuncts and uh, herbs, fruits, other additives that you want to have in, say, cheesecloth or sachets. Um, really makes that process super duper simple. Uh, there is a built-in airlock in the lid. You know what, I did an entire unboxing episode on these. I'll, that side, I'll put it up there in the corner. <laughs> um, but no complaints. Um, except that uh, you might not want to use the built-in airlock. Uh, it evaporates pretty quickly. Um, just something to look out for. If you can keep your eye on it and keep refilling it, you know, day in and day out, um, you know, every day, every other day, then uh, this is honestly as good a choice as any other to start brewing with. All right. And this bad boy, which I just did an unboxing of, uh, I'll go ahead and link that up here, um, was a birthday gift from my wife. I have two of these. Now note, if the marketing is to, believe, is to be believed, uh, you do not need two of this one. Uh, but I am... Uh, a bit skeptical about that. We will, uh, I'll do some brews in it and we will see. I'm not sure if the slope of the uh, conic section on the bottom is steep enough uh, to keep enough sediment from my tastes from, uh, you know, out of the mead. But that's something that will come with time. Uh, you know, I don't want that much mead sitting on dead yeast, um, especially for a full brew time. Um, 
there's the potential for many off flavors uh, to come in, and not ones that I'm specifically looking for. Sometimes I do like to slightly stress a yeast for a little bit of esterification, but, you know, in a very controlled manner. You know, especially if this yeast, you know, if specific yeast is known for producing specific off flavors, or promoting specific flavors. You know, that might be something that I'm looking for. But, sitting a bunch of mead, putting pressure on dead yeast, is not something that I want. Um, but, that's all hypothetical. I still haven't brewed with this. Um, I'll get back to you on that uh, after I do it. Um, and I do have at least one really exciting brew plan uh, for this bad boy. So, you know, go ahead and subscribe if you want to see where this one's going. And that is it for this episode. Um, we've gone through all the various fermenters that I've used in my mead making uh, from early 2013 to now. It's kind of hard to believe that it's been that long. And honestly, any one of these, even the plastic water jugs that I talked about in the beginning, can produce great mead. So if you're willing to plunk down the uh, $200 regular for this, or the uh, $6 or less for this, depending on how you find it, I hope you make some mead. Now, if you like this content, please let me know in the comments. Uh, let me know if there's any pop culture meads you want to see me recreate. Don't forget to uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, do everything that the algorithm likes, or I am told it likes. Say hello to Thor. <laughs> I'm Burley Mullins, and this has been Method of the Meatness. Thank you very much. Sir! Boy, why are you crying? Huh. What why are you crying? Come here. <laughs>